Now a man of the house of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. This portion of scripture is about the birth of Moses. His mother's name was Jochebed. And Jochebed lived in a time when the Egyptian king had made an order to have all the ma male babies thrown into the Nile. He had made another plan before that as well, that all the um, midwives should, you know, when the babies were born, not allow them to live. But they, they, didn't, they, they feared God and they didn't do it. So then he had another plan. And... What he, and this is, can be found in Exodus 122 when he made that order. And then Jochebed, she, she had a daughter named Miriam. Scholars say that she was about six to nine years old when this took place. She was a young girl. Um, she was a young girl like this, the kids gang that just sang up here so beautifully. Um, and I, that, I thought that too when um, they were singing, I was thinking, that's anointed. <laughs> they, they were not being cute today. They were worshiping Jesus, and that was powerful. When, when Jochebed had her baby, she didn't listen to the king's order. You know, I, I, I have to, I think about it, I think, would some women, were, did they really listen to that order? I'm sure some did out of fear or, you know, uncertainty, you know, maybe not knowing God the way that they should, but she didn't. She said, oh, no. She said, I'm going to trust God. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. So she hid the baby for three months until she could not hide him any longer. But she trusted that God was going to help her and take care of her baby. Yogabed made a waterproof basket for her baby to place him in the Nile. I imagine her applying the tar and the pitch, right, and probably praying that it would be sufficient and keep her baby, right, safe. Just imagine, like, with me, like, uh, you know, that how she must have felt. And Miriam, you know, watching her mom make that basket. Like, watch just a little six-year-old six watching her mom make a basket and thinking, you know, even the fear of hiding him, right? I'm sure that she was, she was there with her mother in the house, and she had to watch what was going on when, when, the, when the soldiers came around. The baby, they made sure he was quiet. And so Miriam must have felt, you know, probably unsure, you know, probably scared and even wondering, is that basket really going to protect, you know, the baby? But Miriam watched her mom. And she watched her put the baby in the, in, the, in the basket and in the reeds, right? So sometimes later, sometime later, it says in the word of God that Pharaoh's daughter found the baby, um, Miriam was there, and she went to the Pharaoh's daughter and said, and she went to her. She said, shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Remember, Miriam was only like six or to nine years old. She, and she was young, and she was bold already, right? She was a young girl, and she was, she was a Hebrew girl, and here is the Pharaoh's daughter coming, and she went to her. And, you know, because she had a good role model in her mother, she, had, she saw her mother, so then she thought, the same faith and the same trust that my mom has for God, I'm, I have that too. I know who I am. I know who, who my God is. And she went to that, to the Pharaoh's daughter, and she, she spoke boldly, and she said, you know, do you want me to find somebody? She had a good role, role model. Yochebed modeled a fierce love for her family and God. She trusted God even the, in the midst of death and uncertainty. Think about it. Yochebed could have acted differently, right? Uh, she could have got discouraged. She could have went into a depression. She could have got angry with God. She, she could have even got angry with her husband. You know, she could have just, you know, been upset and just not fight for her family, but she didn't. She modeled a fierceness and a love for, for her children, for her family. And Miriam observed all this. Miriam observed her mother 
as a model, what was she doing? Every day, every day life, every day life, from day to day to day, Miriam was watching her mother. We have an important role in the lives of our families, moms. You know, we model with, what my first point is, we model with our words. What do we say? What are we saying? You know, as a parent, we have to be careful what we say around our kids. Our mouths, our words need to be disciplined. We can build up or tear down as a young mom. I remember that as a first married and, and a young mom, I remember I used to yell. I, I, I don't know why. I think, I think just watching that, my mom, my mom was a yeller. My mom wasn't saved when I was little, but she got saved old, when I was older. And I think I got that from, from her. But then I remember, I remember um, my children's dad, I remember my husband, he, he corrected me. You need to stop that, you know. And I remember I get so mad because, you know, uh, that's how I, that's what I was, you know, was modeled before me. But I thank God that I changed that behavior in, you know, in the beginning, you know, that I, I changed that someone corrected me. And sometimes moms, you know, your husband tells you things. And you don't listen. And I just want to encourage you to, um, to be corrected. Or sometimes your, your friend or your, your, even your mom might correct you about things. And you don't want to hear it. But, if, but, but you know what? It's for our better, right? Because we model with our words. We model with our words. And whatever we do, however we talk, whatever we say, that's what our children are going to say too. They're going to repeat what you say. And so we have to just model with our words and have discipline. Uh, you know, one of the things that um, I, I, I try to be positive, and I encourage you moms, even pray that God would help you to help you to see the cup half full and not half empty. Change your thinking. God can do it. God can change our mentality. You know, even if your kids are, some are young, right now they're being molded step by step. Pastor Al talked about it Friday night, step by step, and he was talking to the men of God. But you know what God put in my heart? That these little people, they're little people. And step by step by step right now, as a mom, we have the responsibility to teach them now. So you know what? When they're growing up, when they're in their teens, they might act a little funny. But when they get to an adult, they will know those steps that you taught them when they were little. You, they will know these songs that these children are singing right now. That's a, that is a stone in their life. When they grow up, they're going to have that in them. And so we, as a parent, our words are so important. Also, our character, we model with our character. Who are you when you're home? Who are you when you're on the phone? Who are you when your children are in the back seat and you're driving? Who are you? Because you're modeling. You're modeling. When somebody, when somebody pulls out in front of you, you're modeling. They're listening. I work with children all day, and I hear what kids say, and I know that that three-year-old or four-year-old didn't come up with that. They heard it from their mom or their dad. So we have to be careful because they're listening. You think they're not listening, but they're listening. You think that they're playing, but they're listening. And so I thank God because I know one of the things that I did as a mom and my husband, what we did as a mom, like when we argued, because we did argue, right? Everybody argues. But we would argue quietly in the bedroom. Like, no, you, you know, you, you, no, you acting up. Why are you, you know? And no, and, and, you know, and then we come out of the room like everything's okay. Because we did not want our children to be fearful, you know, and think like, why are they, you know, what's going on? Why are they fighting? Well, you know. And, you know, some, some children, they, they take it to another level. And they think, are you going to get a divorce? You know, things like that because they're fearful. They don't know they're little. Also, even in the, you know, with problems, you know, when people sometimes would, would you know, in the church, sometimes people are mean and say things. And we would protect our children and not repeat those things in front of them because we didn't want them to get hurt at a young age that people will sometimes come against you. Because how many know it does happen, right? 
it does happen, but we need to be careful of our character um, with our children because we're modeling to them. And also just modeling with your life, you know. As a Christian, we're called to be a light, right? We're called to reach out to people. We're called to bring people into our lives. And our children are watching. Don't ever be afraid um, of your child having to sacrifice for the things of God. Don't be afraid to do that because I remember my children, Sarah was four months old when we went in to run a, a men's home. And she uh, was just an infant, and she grew up in the men's home. And she, is, she has, bec- I believe because of that, is because of who she is growing up in the ministry. Marky as well, little guy in the home. And then even when we came out to Alcohol, you know, it was always a life of giving, a life of opening up our lives and home to people. And that we modeled that. And they now, I, I know Marky has men in his home, and I know, and I think to myself, it's because that's what your dad did. We, we, were, we were in the home for a lot of years. We lived in the home for like, uh, like seven years, and finally we got a three-bedroom apartment. We were able to finally move out of the home, and we rented a three-bedroom apartment. My kids thought that we were living in a hotel when we moved there because, you know, we were by ourselves, and um, we went upstairs to go into our apartment, and they were so cute. They thought we lived in an apartment. But now, it ha- we, because of modeling that, now they can do the same. Don't ever be afraid to uh, allow your children to sacrifice for the kingdom. Don't ever be afraid to let them sacrifice for the kingdom. God is going to honor what you do. God is going to bless Everything that you do, everything that you model to your children, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. People sometimes won't understand it, but you will reap the rewards, and your children will reap the rewards one day. They will reap the rewards one day. So I just want to encourage you because don't be afraid. And then when the trials come, because sometimes they will with your children, right? Sometimes families, I've been through things, you know. But, I, you know, when, when those trials come, we have a choice. Right? We can, we can um, fall and give up, or we can maybe struggle a little bit, but then we got our comeback, right? You got to model with your comeback, right? So no matter what happens, you can always stand back up, amen? Just like, you know, like yoga bed and during those harsh times she faced, she put her trust in God and in the Lord, and she modeled faith and trust in God. And her daughter became a prophetess. Miriam became a a prophetess. So don't give up. You know, don't give up when times get hard, moms. And even right now, some of you may be going through things, but you have a decision to make. You can become bitter or you can become better. You can become bitter or you can become better. And I pray that this morning you will, you will be choose to be better. I mean, that you would choose to be that better mother, that better soldier, that better woman of God, that better grandma, that better employee, that better wife, that you would choose because we have the choice. And I pray that you would make that choice. Amen. God bless you this morning. I will go ahead and close in a prayer. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, I just thank you for today. I pray, Lord, for all your moms this morning. I pray for those that, Lord, may be struggling. God, that you would help them, God, and that you would strengthen them this morning. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And um, now I get the privilege to introduce my daughter, Sarah Evangelista. Thank you, Mom. Happy Mother's Day, and happy Mother's Day to all the beautiful moms out there. I admire mothers because just like she was saying, it's it's a privilege, it's an honor, and um, I'm not a mother, but what I see is I see that it's just so, it's just a privilege. It's a great privilege and honor, and we honor you as children. We stand up here as a children represented. We honor you mothers this morning. So God bless you. Happy Mother's Day. I first um, want to say um, also thank you to our pastors, Pastor Al, Sister Georgina, for this amazing privilege. I feel so um, honored today to stand before you guys. 
Um, I also want to thank our ministers for um, giving me this opportunity. It's never easy coming up here. So when our ministers are up here, back them up because it's hard to come up here. And um, I also want to thank God for my salvation, of course. And um, I've been saved uh, for nine years now, and I feel like I'm just getting started. I feel like I'm just getting started. Um, and last, I want to thank my family. I thank my mom, and I thank my dad. Um, I'm wearing this uh, VO pin that he received in 1989 when he was in the men's home. And he was a men's home graduate. And I feel like, man, I thank God for the home. I thank God for this ministry because if it wasn't for this ministry, I wouldn't be here. My dad would have been dead. He would have been in prison, locked up away. And I feel like, man, this is such a privilege to be here saved. And, and I just, I thank him. I thank him because he sacrificed for us so that I can stand here today and I can stand here and, and, and it's not glory to me, but it's all glory to God that he has kept me and he has kept my family and he had a plan and a purpose from the moment that we were born. He gave us a plan and a purpose. He has a divine appointment for our lives. And you can open up your Bibles up to Genesis chapter 16 and I'm going to read and um verse starting verse one and we're going to read a little bit so i'm going to go ahead and begin it says now sarah abram's wife had bore him no children but she had an egyptian maidservant named hagar so she said to abram the lord has kept me from having children go sleep with the maidservant perhaps i can build a family through her Abram agreed to what Sarah said. So after Abram had been living in Canaan for 10 years, Sarah took his wife, her Egyptian maidservant, Hagar, and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar, and she conceived. When she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Then Sarah said to Abram, you are responsible for the wrong I am suffering but I put my servant in your arms, and now that you, and now that she knows she is pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge you and me. The servant is in your hands, Abram said. Do whatever you think is best. And Sarah mistreated Hagar, so she fled from her. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was a spring that was beside the road to Shur, and he said, Hagar, Servant of Sarah, where have you come from and where are you going? I am running away from my mistress, Sarah, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will increase your descendants that they will be too numerous to count. Verse 11, the angel of the Lord also said to her, you are now with the child and you will have a son. You shall name him Ishmael for the Lord has heard of your misery. In verse 13, when it jumped down, it says, She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. We can go ahead and bow our heads and close our eyes. God, I come before you, God. And I pray, God, that you go before me, God. You remove me. Set me to the side, God, and speak through my life, God. I believe, God, that you're going to refresh every single mother here, God. That a spirit of endurance is going to arise and awaken in every single mom here, God. I thank you for, Lord, what you're going to do, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, here we see a woman who is basically used. Hagar, she was previously an Egyptian princess who was given as a gift to become a maidservant. Imagine that. Imagine being in a high role position and to be sold and given to as a maidservant. Um, have you ever been there? Have you ever been like something was so great in your life or you were promoted and all of a sudden it was stripped away from you and all of a sudden you had to go back and, and felt like almost like you were like just, I guess, I don't know. I feel like you would just have to, like, everything goes away, and then you just, like, get demoted, and you, you feel, like, like so belittled at times. And at that moment, I, be, I really, truly uh, feel that her process of endurance began. She was somebody, a mother. She was somebody who endured. And I, and the title of my message today is A Mother Who Endures. Um, she was then give, given to Abram as his wife, 
to conceive a child. You know, she was found in the, she found herself in this home and with, um, you know, Sarah, who was barren and the Lord had had made her barren. And so what she decided to do was make her own plans. And she decided to to. Yes, she she acknowledged that the Lord had kept her from having children. But she said, but let me do this instead. Let me get Hagar. And, and so Hagar was there. Hagar was there just a servant, just there being obedient to what she had been sent to do. And um, she was a woman who endured. Um, she, she, she began, she began to feel belittled and, and she began, she then, she, it goes on to say that he, um, he, she conceived a child and after she was pregnant, she despised, began to despise Sarah and Sarah began to mistreat her. And it doesn't go on to say, you know, exactly what Sarah did, but she was mistreated so bad that she had to flee, that she fled. That must, that must have been some pretty bad mistreating, right? For, to cause somebody to flee, people don't just leave. People are strong, now, you know, people are strong. And so she must have been treated really, really bad for her to flee. Imagine what Hagar felt as she fled. I believe she felt abused, alone, and used. You know, she was used, and she was pregnant. Imagine a pregnant mother running and fleeing because of the way whatever situation was taking on in her home. At moments, we can find ourselves wanting to do the same thing, right? Wanting to flee. Three things I want to bring out of this story is, number one, the angel of the Lord found her where she was at. In verse 7, it says, um, the angel of the Lord found Hagar near the spring in the desert. God is so sovereign and gentle. He came to her with concern and love. He came. He knew where she was at. He, I believe in this moment, this was a game changer for her because she was in a place where she fled. She left. She said, I got to get away. I can't be here. I can't be mistreated anymore. So she fled. But God seen her, and God found her where she was at. And I believe that God does that. He's so sovereign. He was, she was reminded that God was with her. Secondly, God directed her and commanded her to go back. But he didn't also just tell her to go back and didn't, you know, just, just do it because. But he gave her a promise. In verse 9, it says, the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. Then the angel added this promise. I will so increase your descendants that they may be too numerous to count. Imagine how much humility this took for Hagar to, to, to humble herself, to really respond and listen to what the angel of the Lord was saying. Was she at this, at this moment, she had to believe, am I really going to believe this angel and, and the promise that he's prophesying over my life? Or am I just going to stay stuck here and not do anything and, and, and just keep on running and keep on fleeing? But when God challenges us, he always does, he always asks us to do something that's going to cause us to hurt or something to sacrifice. But he also gives us that word to stand on. He gives us a promise. He doesn't leave us empty-handed. And he reminds us something great will come from our obedience. She was obedient. The third thing is in, uh, found in verse 13 is that she gave this the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me, for she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. She had a moment with God. She's seen God. And I believe mothers here today, you have seen God. You have seen God. He has met you. He has found you. He has commanded you, challenged you, gave you a promise because you have seen him. After she went back, she apologizes, and she trusted God to protect her son because it was not hers. It was for them. She, 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 she trusted God to, that, they, that he would be in their care. She responded to what God had asked her to do. I believe Hagar gained encouragement being in the presence of God. Have you been there, Mom? Have you gained encouragement from being in the presence of God? She shook off the hurt and realized she couldn't run anymore. She couldn't run anymore. Have you ever been there where you couldn't run anymore? I know I've been there. A spirit of reinsurance and trust arose in her life. 
Mom, we have to stay in the presence of God because that's what we need. When you're weak, God will quicken your spirit and remind you to remember who you have seen and you'll be able to persevere with an enduring spirit. She was somebody who endured. And we need moms, we need women here to say, I need a spirit of endurance in my life. I need to fight. I need to keep on going because there's a promise behind everything that you do, mom. There is a promise. Remember, your role as a mother is so important and valuable. It's so valuable. There's no love like a mother's love. When you're strong, your children are strong. Build yourself in the word of God, fasting, praying. Ask God, you know, like my mom was saying, be that model. Ask God to give you a spirit of endurance at times when it gets hard. Moms, grandmothers, do you have a spirit of endurance today in your life? Examine your life. Examine your heart. Have you truly seen God? Because he's the one who sees you. And if you have if you have had those divine moments in your life, I believe a spirit of endurance is in you this morning. But you have the power of God. You have access to, to, to see the power of God move. You have the power of God. Who is, his, spirit, his spirit is living and active in your life. What miracle are you in need of, mom? What miracle? Examine your miracle. Look at your miracle. And allow that to, to propel you to have that spirit of endurance. If you're still here trusting God, in God with your entire life and with your children's lives, there are no limits to what God can really do. God fulfilled the promise he gave to Hagar for her son Ishmael. In uh, verse seven, chapter 17, verse 12, it says, the, And the angel of the Lord said, And as for Ishmael, I have heard you. I will surely bless him. I will make him fruitful. And will greatly increase his numbers. He will be the father of 12 rulers. And I will make him into a great nation. He did it for Hagar. He did it for Hagar. And I believe that mom, he's going to do it for you. But it's going gonna, it's gonna to cause you to have a spirit of endurance. I pray this word encouraged you. And I pray, mom, that you continue to run and you continue to fight. And you might think, well, wow, what's the why? What's the why? But because your children have a promise. And, we, and, and, and you hear our pastor every week and coming up here. A spirit of, we're in a spirit of strengthening, right? And we're raising up an army. And this promise is not just for you to see your children succeed out there in the world, but believe that God has a purpose and a plan for his, their lives and that they are a part of this army. They can be here. They can fight. They can be a part of what God is doing in this church. And I'm going to go ahead and pray out. We could all bow our head and close our eyes. God, I come before you, God, and I thank you, Lord. I pray every mom here would be refreshed by you, God. They would be reminded, God, to have a spirit of endurance, oh God, that everything they do for you, God, you will not, God, leave them empty-handed, God. God, continue to remind them of the promises, God, that you've given them, God, the way that they have seen you, oh God. They, have, they know, God, they trust you, God. So I pray, God, that you continue to have your way, God, do what you want to do, God. Make a spirit of endurance arise, God, in our moms, God. We thank you and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. And um, I have the honor and privilege of um, introducing our next speaker, and he's no stranger to us. And um, I thank him. I love him. He's my brother, but he's my friend as well. And I could say he's my favorite worship leader, and uh, I love you, Marky. You can help me welcome Pastor Marky. I better be your favorite worship leader. No, I'm just kidding. Well, it's an honor this morning, amen, and, and I feel like everything's been said, amen, and they've been, those are two powerful words this morning, and um, I thank God for my salvation. I got saved um, in 2005, and I thank God because, um, you know, I didn't know that my, my mom, my mom preached in my dad's Bible. My sister had the pen. I don't have anything sentimental up here, but the Lord spoke to me and said, you have his name. 
And I give honor where honor's due, you know. I, and I, lo I love my dad. I know he's in heaven, but I, I thank God for him. Thank God for my family. I thank God for my pastors. You know, Pastor Androgina, you know, uh, well, it's been, it's been nine years now since I've been here. And they took me in. They seen something in me when, when, when everything around me didn't look like it was going to be okay. You know, and I thank God for pastors like that, that they could see something five, ten years from now in your life. You know, that's something special when you have pe when you have pastors in your life that could have vision for you when it's hard to have vision for yourself. I thank you, Pastor Andrew Jean. I love you both. This church, this church has been, you know, um, an amazing, amazing church to serve in. All the ministers, we have the best ministers. We have the best staff. Can we give our ministers a hand this morning? Amen. And I just thank God. I thank, my, I thank God for my beautiful wife. Amen. And she's a mother of one child. <laughs> she's a mother this morning, and I thank her. She's a hard worker. And, um, man, she keeps me on my toes. Come on, somebody. She's sharp. She's sharp. And, and, man, she's amazing. She does more than me. Honestly, she really does. And I thank God for you, Brianna. I love you. Amen. But why don't we stand this morning for the reading of the word? Amen. You know, pastor said, you know, his message lasted the week. My message didn't even last till offering. <laughs> so, amen. I know I'm in that tune this morning. But we're going to jump ahead and then we'll fall back, okay? First Kings chapter 17, verse 17. I'm going to read it. Just do, do for time, amen. Now, it happened after these things that the son of the woman who owned the house became sick. And his sickness was so serious that there were... There was no breath left in him. Somebody say, no breath. So she said to Elijah, what have I to do with you, O man of God? Have you come to bring my sin into remembrance and to kill my son? And, she, and, and he said to her, powerful words, give me your son. Give me your son. Let's pray. God, we thank you. For the reading of your word, God, we thank you, Father, for the messages that have been brought this morning, God, and our hearts have been open. Our hearts have been challenged. God, not just mothers here this morning, but men, sons, and daughters have been in, in, have been challenged and encouraged this morning. And I pray that you do it again this morning. We thank you for the miracles that are taking place. We thank you for the families that are here. I ask that you move me aside. Let your anointing flow in this place in the mighty name of Jesus. Somebody shout Amen. Look at your neighbor and tell him you look good this morning. You go ahead and be seated. I'm not going to be long this morning because I feel that God wants to just move this morning. And the title of my message this morning is The Immovable Mother. The Immovable Mother. You know, and, and this morning, this morning we celebrate every single mother here this morning. And, and we know this story. We heard about it this morning and, and I just read a portion of it but you know the story we read is, 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 is it seemed to be a hopeless situation and how many ever been in a place where you you thought you were in a situation that was hopeless you thought you were in a situation and many of many many times when God comes into our life it's a hopeless situation wave at me if you know that it's a hopeless situation and, and we see a hopeless situation here, something that, that wasn't understandable, something that you can't conceive, something that, 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 that shocks the soul, amen, and, and you see it, but, but God turned it around for his honor and his glory. How many, how many have been turned around for the glory of God this morning? And in many ways, you and I can relate with this widow. When God came into our lives, he came to what seemed to be a hopeless situation, but God always has a plan. We see this woman who was really at her last and lowest place of life encounter the man of God because of this woman's obedience to the word of the Lord herself and her household became blessed. You know, when you read in, in verse 7 and you read, you read about the widow, you read about her obedience, you read about how she responded to the man of God. As a matter of fact, she, re she responds to Elijah and she said, the Lord, your God, not even her God. Not even the one that she served. She said, I see the word of the Lord upon you so strong. It's your God. And I'm just going to be obedient. 
and she received a blessing. But see, what you have to understand, my friend, mothers and fathers and sons and, 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 and daughters, you have to understand that when you're obedient to the Lord, it's not just for yourself, it's for your legacy. It's not just for yourself, but you're planting seed in the ground. I love what Pastor said last week. You know, we took up a pledge. We took up a pledge, right, to, set, to, to, to move into a new level, a new season. And he said that there was a single mother who already paid off their pledge. You know what that speaks to me? She knows that there's good soil in the house of God. She knows that may, she might be in situations where she, there may be times where she may feel certain things. She may, there may be times where she may be lowly. Come on, somebody. But she knows she's sowing seed, not for herself, but for her future. See, you got you to gotta understand here. God is not a God that's in our time. God is a God who's thinking ahead. God is a God who's progressive. And is he setting you up for your next season? How many know that it's about your inheritance that's going to receive the full blessing? Well, you're saying I might be 55. I might be, I might be 45. It's, it, it's too late for me. It's never too late, my friend. It's never too late, my friend. This is a perfect example of a widow. You know, a widow, widows in the Bible are notorious for, for, for being very poor. You know, she was gathering sticks. She didn't even have wood for the fire. She was gathering sticks. She was going to go in and die, and then she received a blessing. You know, that blessing to, to, have, to have the flour and the oil, you know, it reminds me, even, even how Elijah told her, bring me a cake. I've never seen anybody walk into Kirkland to buy a flat sheet of cake for themselves. I never seen anybody that wants to enjoy a cake for themselves. I never seen anybody that just wants to have a, a full smorgasbord by themselves. Come on, somebody. But how many know it's something special when you gather around the table and you have dinner with your family and 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 you and you and you and you and you break bread even with your church family? It wasn't meant that that miracle wasn't meant just for her to live day to day. It was meant for her son to rec recognize that there was a miracle working God in the midst. So what do we see? We see them go from, from broke and, 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 and they become blessed. But then what happens? Her faith gets tested. Her faith gets tested. A mother's love is, is the foundation in a home. Can somebody say amen? If there is one thing a mother can do in the house, it shift the whole atmosphere. I remember my mom was yelling, come on, somebody. Pastor, I didn't know if she was speaking in tongues or Spanish. I didn't know if she was in the flesh or the spirit, but I know it was yell she was yelling up in there. You know, I knew, I knew, I knew when I was in trouble. Come on, somebody. Because I wouldn't get just get Marky, I get Marco Antonio Evangelista Jr. I get the whole name and I'm like, I don't even speak Spanish, mom. Come on, somebody. But they could shift the whole atmosphere. Mother, I want you to know that, yes, you could, fish, you could shift the whole atmosphere in your house if you're in the flesh, but you can also shift the whole atmosphere in the house if you're walking in the spirit. If you're walking in obedience. That's why Sister Sylvia walked up here and said, all of my children stand up. 17 of my children, 17 members of my family stand up. Why? Because she shifted the atmosphere. Mothers, you have the power to shift the atmosphere in your home. To shift the atmosphere in your home, it's a, 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 it's a foundational thing. It's, 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 it's being the rock of your home. What happens when the, sh the, the foundation is shift? My friend, there's, there begins to be an earthquake. There begins to be a movement in the home. There begins to be something special. Why? Because a mother is a rock in the home. Can somebody say amen? What this widow didn't understand in this moment is that the decision she made to step out in faith and take care of the man of God, even though he had her own, she had her own needs, said she, she set, set her son up for more than just food in the house, but she set them up for a, a spiritual inheritance. Evangelist Billy Graham said the greatest legacy one can pass on to one's child and grandchild is not money or material things accumulated in one's life but rather a legacy of character and faith somebody give the Lord a praise this morning I love what my mom says she said don't get scared for your children to sacrifice for the kingdom even your children will are making deposits into the kingdom wow even your child you don't even know you're already setting them up for a spiritual inheritance 
They don't even know it. They may just see, man, I may not be able to get a happy meal today, but I may not be able to go to the store today, but I'm setting you up, son, not for right now. I'm setting you up for your future. I thank God for parents that stepped out in faith. I thank God for parents that stepped out in faith that they didn't teach me what it was to shrink back. They taught me what it was to move forward. So today I can't speak to you about a mother because I'm not a mother. But I can speak to you about being a son. I can speak to you about being a son. And I just want to give you two points and we're going to pray this morning because I feel God moving in this place. I want to talk to you about the first point. A mother's strength becomes our strength. A mother's strength becomes our strength. There have been times where I wasn't sure if I was going to make it and my mother had to remind me of the promise. Somebody give, give, give the mothers a hand clap this morning. When they remind you of the promise of God on your life. And a mother is steadfast. A mother, a mother, a mother's an anchor. A mother's a rock. A mother is one who remembers the promise even when we forget it. A mother is the one. You know, I went up to Mighty Men. My mom called me and she said, look, I just want, I just, I, I just want to call you because I want, I want to pray for you that, that God is going to speak to you at Mighty Men, that you're going to leave change. She didn't say, oh, uh, this is what's going on in my day. Oh, I'm stressed out. No, she spoke into my faith. She spoke into my spirit. And she reminded me that God has a word for you this week. Mother's strength becomes our strength. So, mother, let me ask you, are you being strength this morning? Let me remind you as a son that, and, as a, and, and as a daughter this morning, as your children, we glean off of your strength. We glean off of that, that love. We glean off of that reassurance. We glean off of that confidence. Come on, somebody. The mother is the number one fan. The number's the one, number one fan. The number one will even lie to you if you're not even good looking. They'll tell you you're good looking. Because why they're your number one fan. But let me tell you something. That through that, confidence is built. And with a godly, godly mother, godly confidence is built. And let me tell you something. That God has a plan for you this morning. The strength becomes our strength. Just like many of you, I see my mother sacrifice and work hard just to make sure that my life was good. She did her best to make sure my life was good and that I was happy. Come on. Are we grateful this morning? And this widow's decision to trust the man of God of the word of the Lord put her in a place to see God move powerfully in her life. Obedience. Somebody say obedience. And the second point this morning is a mother's fight is a fight for the promises of your family. How many have a promise this morning? You have a promise for your family. You have a promise. In verse 17, we see this widow go to the man of God mad. Mad. How many, how many know she was human? She was human. It was natural that Mama Bear came out in that moment. Has Mama Bear ever came out? Has La Shy Girl ever came out? <laughs> Come on, somebody. And you get mad? Oh, you get mad, right? Somebody messes your child, you mad? You get mad? That's that. Come on. Don't look. You guys are holy all of a sudden. And what, it, what, it, what does she say to the man of God? What have I to do with you, O oh man of God? Have you come to bring me my sin in remembrance and to kill my son? And she, and she slipped into a moment where she thought that this was because of, her, of, of what she had did in the past. You know, and I know this morning that we have people here that we didn't live a perfect life. And I know sometimes that there can be moments in our life where we begin to feel bad about the life that we used to live. But how I many know oh, God has turned all that around? God has turned all that around. God has turned that around. And my wife, she 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 works she works right now, and she's doing uh she's in 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 in, in what, what is a foster home, a foster home, and she sees children. She sees children week in week out. Sometimes they're there because of, of, you know, of the system. And sometimes they're there because the parents send them there. The parents send them there. And, 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 and what happens is she sees them counseling. She sees them talking. And the parent gets, feels bad about the situation. But how many know that when you get saved, that you get a promise from God? And he turns everything around. And he makes something new. Something that was hopeless. He makes it new. 
And this widow went to the man of God and held him to his word. How many have ever had to hold God to his word? And what did the man of God say? Give me your son. Give me your son. Matthew, come up to me. Give me your son. Everything was going good. And now this widow had to be tried with her faith. Even though she was mad and even though she didn't understand one thing, she did right was she did right was she went back to the man of God who brought the word of the Lord and 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 what were his his words, give me your son. When we put our children and we put our situation in the hands of God, he begins to work out for our good, work it out for our good. When we put our children, when we put our situation, when we put our promise, when we put our, our, our career, when we put our ministry in the hands of God, how many know he works it out for our good? You know, I, I'm a father, but I can only do so much. But in the hands of God, he could do so much more. And so what happened in this moment? If you read about it, Elisha takes him into the upper room. Why? Why? Because he didn't want to be, he didn't want to be separated. And the Bible says that he threw himself three times on the child. Not once, not twice, three times. That he had to give everything. And I think that's uh, something that we can learn from. We have to really ask ourselves this morning, are we giving everything to the promise that God gave us? We have to give everything to that. I know this morning that maybe your son or your daughter may not be saved. But you have to give yourself more to it. That the promises for your children are inheritance in the kingdom. And this morning, when we look at this, we see that the man of God didn't feed into her doubt. He fed into her faith. The man of God didn't feed into her doubt. Even though she was mad in the moment. Even though she didn't understand. Even though that a miracle just happened. But this new one came up. This new trial. He didn't feed into her doubt. He fed into her faith. I want you to know this morning that God is trying to feed into your faith this morning. You want to see a miracle on Mother's Day? It's when your child comes to, the, comes to service and something begins to shake their inner core. They begin to feel the presence of God again. Because the seed has been planted the seed has been planted for them to be a man of God for them to be a woman of God for them to answer the call of God what you've seen this morning wasn't a cute choir it's seeds in the kingdom it's weapons being developed it's weapons being developed for the kingdom of God we're not playing games but we're making weapons we're waking we're making up a an army for the army of God this morning can you give the Lord a praise We're making weapons. And I know that some of you may be here and you're visiting. You might have came with your mother. I want, you, I want you to know this morning, you just didn't come to visit. God has a word for you. You didn't just come for, for you know, uh, just to make Mother's Day a, a, a religious day. I want you to know that God is speaking to your heart right now. And he's saying, I've called you. And, and I have a plan for you. And, and I know things may not look perfect. Situations might look hopeless. But let me tell you something, my friend. Let's feed into your faith because a seed has been planted. Let's feed into your faith this morning that God has a plan and a purpose for every life that's here this morning. If I could be honest with you, I don't relate with the widow. I relate with the son. Bible said he had no breath in his lungs. I've been in times where I had no life. I've been in times where my situation, everything around me thought it was being, sh it was being shooken up. And I had no life. I had no breath. I, 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 I couldn't see purpose. Oh, but I thank God for a mother. I said, I thank God for a mother. That had to remind me of the promises that I got when I was 12. That had to remind me that I was born for this. My friend, I want you to know something. That this morning, God wants to give a new promise. And this is what we're going to do this morning. Mother, if your family came, and if you have your family here, you have your husband, you have your kids, I want to I pray for you this morning. I want to pray for you this morning. Why? Because I believe that we're feeding into your faith this morning. 
And there is a seed in there. There's a seed that has been planted. And it's time that it gets watered. And it's time that it grows. So I want you to do this. I want you to grab your family. I want you to come up this morning. If you brought your family, I want to pray for you this morning. Because I believe, I feel God moving in this.